grandest social network is the brain. It's also the oldest social network. It's had in its present shape and size about two million years to evolve. So it's the grandest and oldest social network in the world. We've never thought of it that way. What if I told you that the brain has a hundred billion users? A single brain, your brain, has a hundred billion users. What if I told you that the way in which the brain communicates internally is through a technology that we've recently discovered? It's a wireless type of technology. So you have the grandest, oldest social network utilizing what is really a, co a cutting edge technology. It's quite extraordinary. It's all very personal to me. And it's all very personal to you. This is my mom, born in 1920, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, MS, in 1958, suffered about 22 years of progressive decline. And MS is a disease that affects the brain, the optic nerves, the spinal cord, and it impairs the communication. In her case, principally within the brain. The treatment for her was surgical procedures, very painful, things like spinal taps, um, drugs, of course, with some efficacy and tremendous numbers of side effects. Things haven't changed a lot since, since those days. And the doctors really didn't have ability to manage her disease. And this is true of many neurological dysfunctions. This is just one. Other examples, autism spectrum disorder, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, the list goes on and on of these types of neurological disorders. What I'm going to talk about tonight, everything I have to talk about tonight, is about understanding the social network of the brain, listening to it, talking to it, and not invasively diagnosing diseases of this type and further therapeutically treating diseases of this type. The key word here is non-invasive. Is it possible? Well, the answer is yes. It is possible. And in order to really understand the possibilities, which are truly limitless, we need to understand the central nervous system at its most fundamental level, which are the nerve fibers. And when I was referring to 100 billion users in the brain before, I was referring to the nerve fibers in the brain. There's about 100 billion. Facebook has 2 billion users. So we're really talking about a big social network within our own brain. It's a picture. It's an electron micrograph of the nerve fibers in a certain portion of the brain. Each and every one of them, along its length, carries an electrical impulse. And some of you know we call this an action potential. And this is the way the brain communicates to a great extent, within itself and with other limbs and the central nervous system throughout our body. Each one of these is very tiny. They're extraordinary. Each one of these is, in diameter, tinier than a human hair. And there's a hundred billion of there in there. We've made two discoveries. And these discoveries are really game changers in the understanding of the human brain and generally the central nervous system. These nerve fibers don't just carry impulses along their length, but like neighbors, packed in a dense neighborhood, they talk to each other. They communicate with each other. They compete and they collaborate with each other. They do everything that you would expect users in a Facebook social network to do. 
So you have this interaction, we call it crosstalk, between the fibers, creates a very sophisticated network, truly sophisticated. In addition to that, the technology they use, if I can call it technology, that they use to communicate with each other is very similar to Apple Pay and Google Wallet. You never thought I'd say that, but that's, that's exactly true. It's called near-field communications. And you can, probably not a good time to do it, but you can take your cell phone out, take a look on the back, most of you will know this, and some of your phones will be enabled for contactless payment or near-field near communication. Similar sort of technology. So once we understand these, these, uh, these two discoveries, the world opens up, possibilities really open up. Because if we're going to listen to the brain, we're going to be listening to near-field communication signals, like wireless signals. And these are going to change with time. We need to understand that. As a person gets old, the signals change. As a person suffers a neurological dysfunction, the signals change as they go through the progressive stages. And that's, in some ways, an excellent diagnostic tool because we listen to those signals, we sense those changes, and we diagnose a patient non-invasively. Now, of course, we need a lot to do this. I mean, I might make it sound a little simple, but in order to sense these signals, we need very sensitive receivers, we need extraordinary antennas, we need to push technology, which is what we've been doing in a variety of ways. In addition to that, we need to know how the language of the brain expresses itself. And we've talked, we've spent thousands of hours talking to individuals with neurological dysfunctions and matching their clinical studies against what they really tell us, against our own observations. An individual with Alzheimer's will present those symptoms in a wide variety of ways, not just one way. So we've developed software in an expert system kind of setting which captures all of that information and utilizes it along with our very sensitive hardware. So what I want you to do is come into the lab and take a look at a few examples. And the two examples I have for you this evening, one is autism, spectrum disorder, and the other is Alzheimer's. The first is autism, and I'll show it to you in two different ways. Because as humans, we like to see things, we like to hear things, and sometimes that's difficult with the brain. So in order to see things, we need an imaging system that takes a snapshot of the activity in the brain, the activity of those nerve fibers. And with autism, it's all about the balance between excitation and inhibition in populations of nerve fibers. If there's a balance, the individual does not present with autistic spectrum disorder symptoms. Now this picture shows us, it looks like a, tr a forest where the trees are evenly spread across the landscape. It's an individual do that does not present as an autistic individual, so that we have a balance between excitation and inhibition. And there's a sound associated with this. Well, there should be a sound associated with this. Sound associated with this, which is, it's a, it's a rumbling sound, but it's a constant sound. Now, this is an individual that presents with autis autistic uh, symptoms and the serious symptoms. It's like that forest got plowed through, and there's a very great imbalance between excitation and inhibition. So this individual sees colors very brightly, much brightly than a normal individual would see. This individual hears sounds that are sometimes excruciating. And there's a, a sound that goes along with this type of behavior. 
You're the first that have heard these. This is such a diverse audience, really, that I've never presented before such a, a wonderful group to actually hear these things. It's choppy. It's higher in frequency. Now, what's going on? Associated with these types of dysfunction, the near-field communication waves in the brain have different characteristics. We call it different signatures. And now most of those are very low frequency. They're below our threshold of hearing. So in order for you to hear them, I've had to faithfully raise them up so you could hear them and hear those differences. Now those differences can be used to not, the differences and the images can be used to non-invasively diagnose individuals. Now the next example is a little more complicated. We have a brain <laughs> and we have electric field outside the brain and first what we're doing is listening with sensitive receivers to the waves in the brain that are associated with memory consolidation. So the problem is one of Alzheimer's. Certain times of the day in certain areas of the brain, the brain waves become what we call coherent. In other words, they change from being rather noisy to a single frequency wave. And when that single frequency wave occurs, the brain is performing an efficient memory consolidation process. And the individual does not present with Alzheimer's. When the brain remains noisy, it's the opposite. The consolidation process is inefficient and the individual does not remember their wives, their sons, their daughters. So what we'll hear here is first the noisy signal of the brain and then as we apply the electric field, very low level electric field, it trains the brain to a coherent state. And it's what we call a positive feedback kind of activity. I'm starting off noisy, actually it builds and it becomes more coherent. And this is what it looks like graphically. Time is in the front, time goes back, and if you move up the yellow shock fin, what you're seeing really is a consolidation of waves in the brain, a noisy state, and with the electric field becoming much more coherent and increasing. So it's, uh, what you've just witnessed really is the diagnosis of an extraordinarily complex disease and one type of therapeutic treatment, all non-invasive, because we're learning how to listen to the brain, not hear the brain, but really listen to it, and its dynamic language, and train it, if necessary. These are game changers, I believe. This is a paradigm shift. You know, the medical profession many times will move toward drugs. We've seen all the commercials. The drugs do this, they could cause this. And it's just beyond belief that it hasn't changed since my mom was afflicted with multiple sclerosis. And of course, as I've grown older and engaged more with colleagues and a community, I realized that to the left and to the right of me, Many times, I see the millions of individuals in this world that are afflicted with neurological dysfunction or mental disorders. And if you can do something about it, it's important to. 1958, actually 1960, and the doctors told my mom, have another baby because they thought that the, the hormonal changes would help manage the disease. I have a brother, he's a great doctor, I wonder why, you know, <laughs> he's a great doctor, and uh, it didn't help. It didn't help my mom. Maybe a little joy in her life, of course. Uh, bathe in warm water. Now we know that's exactly the wrong thing to do. And of course, drugs and their side effects. We can all make a difference. And I think the near future holds a non-invasive 
treat, diagnostic treat, diagnosis, diagnosis, and therapeutic treatment of many of those things that uh, we know do exist. And every one of you probably knows someone. And I want you to take heart, because in the near future, things will improve greatly. In the distant future, I only leave you to imagine. <laughs> because the avenues and the opportunities, I think, are truly limitless.